So what I'm gonna to talk to you today is about a new model for care delivery that I've been working on developing with my friend and colleague, David Ash. And in essence, where we start here is healthcare delivery in 2011. So we have a healthcare system that is really based on reactive visit-based models of care. You get sick, you go to the doctor. And there's several problems with this. Well, one is that this is in large part a byproduct of the fact that health financing is largely based on a fee-for-service model where providers are paid money when you go to see them. And healthcare providers, even if they wanted to change this model and focus on keeping people healthy, don't for the most part have really good tools to do that. So if I have a patient who's morbidly obese and I have seven minutes to see them, I don't really have great tools at my disposal where within that time, along with all the other things I'm supposed to do, I can figure out how to really help this patient solve their problem. Another issue is that when you think about the where patients spend their time, even if I'm a patient who has a lot of medical problems, I actually don't spend much time in a doctor's office. You know, I might spend 20 minutes every three months. If I have a chronic illness, I might spend an hour a month with maybe five or six different providers. So, of course, when you factor in that there are roughly 8,000 plus hours in a year, that means the vast majority of your time, you're not in the doctor's office. So, the issue here is that lots of studies have been showing that individual behavior is one of the key drivers of US healthcare issues, both in terms of bad outcomes. So when we look at causes of premature mortality, much of what we're dealing with here are factors that are very difficult to change. So I can't really change somebody's genetic predisposition using current technology. I can't really change their social and environmental circumstances. A relatively small part of premature mortality is actually due to inadequate health care, and much of it is due to behavior patterns. So there's lots of statistics that support this assertion. About 70% of the US population is overweight or obese. We spend about $2.5 trillion a year on treating patients. Uh, about 97% of what we spend is on treating patients as opposed to on preventing disease. So the, one of the issues to think about here is when you think about, well, what do we do about this and what kind of interventions do we think about? we have to think about how people make decisions. And, you know, of course, we're taught in our standard economics courses that people are rational expected utility maximizers. And to some degree, this is true. You know, to some degree, people think about the future, they think about the probabilities of different events that could happen to them, how good or how bad they'd feel if outcome X versus Y happened. But as we know from lots of work in behavioral economics, that's only part of the story. And there's a lot of other factors that go into decision making. We know that people very heavily favor immediate gratification. They're very loss averse. They're overly optimistic. They're very susceptible to framing effects. Their emotions often affect what they do. And that's, of course, particularly true when you have an acute illness. There's lots of issues around self-control when we think about the issues people face when, for example, they're trying to stop smoking or control their weight, it's obvious that's, that's often part of, the, part of the challenge. And what we need to think about here is that a lot of these decision errors really make unhealthy behaviors much more likely, and we have to figure out how to factor that into what we do. So one of the approaches that large employers are taking is they're really moving towards using financial incentives in various ways. And the, a recent survey by the National Business Group on Health and Towers Watson suggested that about 50% of large employers are using incentives for healthy behavior in 2011. This is going to be an estimated 80% this year. And one of the things I want to point out in terms of why employers are moving in this direction is there's a fairly pervasive problem in the US of focusing on the present as opposed to the future. So this is an example of uh, what has happened over time in terms of the rate of growth of Starbucks versus payday lenders. And you can see that although Starbucks is quite ubiquitous, payday lenders have grown at about triple the rate. So when we're talking about health behavior, this isn't really a unique phenomenon. We have fairly pervasive problems with people focusing on immediate benefits or immediate costs as opposed to future benefits and future costs. So a new model for health that we've been working on with a group of people at Penn 
is called the way to health. And you might wonder, why is this called the way to health? Well, part of it is because we were developing this at the University of Pennsylvania. And in 1758, Benjamin Franklin developed the way to wealth. And the way to wealth was basically a guide to prosperity based on Poor Richard's Almanac, where Franklin <coughs> sought to help people overcome behaviors that basically acted against their self-interest. So we know that this is a big issue now in terms of people's health interest. And we've been working on developing a platform called the Way to Health that provides a scalable approach to using behavioral economics to trying to help people overcome some of their health problems. So this, what this platform is, is it basically uses a variety of wireless home-based or employer-based devices. These devices can measure whether you're taking your medicine, how many steps you're taking per day, what your weight is, what your blood pressure is, what your blood sugar is. And these devices then feed inputs into a central server that can give you automated feedback based on how you're doing each day, or in some cases, multiple times a day. And we've used these approaches in various contexts, like working on weight loss. This is an example of a study we did among veterans at the Philadelphia VA Hospital, where we randomized people to either be eligible for daily lotteries or pre-commitment contracts where people can put their own money at risk, which they would lose if they're not successful in meeting weight loss goals. And we match the, their money, in this case, one to one. And you can see the lotteries and deposit contracts are both much more effective than controls. But the challenge in running an intervention like this, when you think about how do we operationalize a behavioral economics intervention, is that if you do this manually, it's actually quite intensive. Uh, and so, for example, when we've done this in the past, uh, we always had done this manually. And you, you can see there's all these steps involved in terms of calculating what sort of incentive participants available, eligible for, giving them that feedback, uh, figuring out how to verify what they're doing, transmitting messages to them, and then transferring payment. So with this new platform, now this is all automated, where you just give the participant access to the device. The device transmits the information. The server then can calculate what sort of feedback they should get through whatever modality the participant chooses. And then we can electronically transfer them funds. So it's a much more scalable approach to thinking about how do we automate some of the hovering that we might want to do for high-risk patients? Because if you think about other approaches to doing this, for example, using personnel and case management, there is no way that you could afford to pay people to have this ongoing dialogue with each patient every day about all their measures. It just would not be economically viable. And if you think about where this might lead us is what we're hoping and I don't know if 2014 is, is realistic here, but I put it down as an aspiration. So hopefully this will lead us to a proactive, non-visit-based model in which we can give inputs to providers on what their patients are doing at home. We can then give pre-specified automated feedback to patients. We can use a variety of behavioral economic engagement strategies to keep people engaged in using these devices and engaged in their health using either financial incentives or various types of social incentives. Um, we can then think about how do we create a model in which we have health financing that's based on caring for a population and keeping them healthy, as opposed to a health financing model that really re revolves around treating people once they get sick. And another piece of this, which I think is going to be really important, is thinking about how various other organizations fit into this picture as, in essence, allies in terms of health delivery. So organizations like Weight Watchers and Minute Clinic, can they help where if you're a primary care doctor and you have a population of people who have a high rate of obesity, can they help us by, by in essence, being a referral source? So if I have seven minutes to see somebody, I now have all these other tools at my disposal. Some of this is based on this remote wireless monitoring, but now I also have a, a wider array of programs I can send people to, and we have to figure out how do you make them part of the health financing model? So the key piece that needs to be developed is really thinking about how these devices, how these engagement strategies, how these different partners all fit in to traditional healthcare delivery models. So you're not just thinking about the standard model that we have now in 2012. Thank you.